Um, so now we'll uh, Thanks move for on. You. Yeah. Thank you, Lars. So we'll move on to our, our next speaker um, and our next paper. So the paper is called Carbon Default Swap, Disentangling the Exposure to Carbon Risk Through Carbon Default Swaps. And um, our speaker is uh, Alexander Blasberg. Uh, and I believe he's currently a PhD student at the uh, Universität Duisburg Essen. Um, so not such a such a long um, title to read out, but uh, let's just play with some more German words while I'm here. Uh, he is a Wissenschaftlicher Mitarbeiter, which means postdoc in English. Um, so uh, thank you very much for being here, Alexander, and for submitting your paper. And um, you know you've got about thirty minutes to present. Oh, sorry. Right? Yeah, 30 minutes to present, and then we'll have a five-minute discussant and five minutes Q&A. And of course, if you finish briefer, then we'll have more of that. Um, yeah, so over to you, Alexander. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for the kind introduction, Sebastian. Um, so the pronunciation was perfect. Um, um, yeah, in, in our work, um, we um, sort of uh, investigate uh, so this work. It's a joint work, with, by the way. Rüdiger Kiesel, who is also from the University of Duisburg-Essen, and uh, the, my colleague Luca Toschini from uh, University of Edinburgh Business School and the LSE. And in our paper, we sort of investigate um, the effect of carbon risk on um, credit default swaps. And so in, in, in general, we are in the, in the credit sphere. And the question is, OK, why do we look at credit default swaps? And the main reason being that credit default swaps uh, sort of provide uh, a unique window of looking at the problem in a forward-looking way. So just to give you an idea of those of you unaware of what a credit default swap is. So what you do with a credit default swap basically is you insure yourself as an investor or lender against the default of a certain firm. And um, with that, you can sort of insure yourself against this event for a different tenure. So usually you can trade um, credit default swaps or CDS from one up to 30 years. So CDS by itself, by construction are forward looking and that's very nice. So we cannot only um, investigate how carbon risk affects CDS. Uh, what we also do, and that's I think the main contribution of our paper, we are also able to develop a, a, a metric, a measure of carbon risk that is forward looking. And I think that's one of the most important things nowadays in, in the climate finance uh, literature uh, is to sort of uh, quantify uh, the exposure to carbon risk, uh, but in a way that it is forward looking, right? And what usually has been done in the literature uh, is to use carbon emissions to sort of have a natural idea of how a firm is exposed to the transition. Right. So the more and the argument is the more you emit, the more you are naturally exposed to a low carbon transition. Um, but of course, this logic, although it's it's nice and easy to understand, it has the drawback that we um, rely on past information. Right. Emissions are always past information. We cannot sort of uh, use this in any forward looking way. So there is a recognition that we sort of need to supplement the emission data. Uh, and by the way, also ESG ratings are uh, for uh, usually uh, backward looking. Uh, so it, there is a recognition that we need to supplement this information, this firm specific information with forward looking data. And there is some uh, literature already investigating this. Uh, what usually has been done uh, so far is to look at emission reduction targets uh, pledged by certain firms, uh, which sort of incorporate uh, the, the forward-looking um, perspective in a way that uh, what, what the firm pledges to do uh, in, let's say, 10 or 20 years. And uh, as I said, we are in the credit sphere. So um, we are looking at it uh, in from, from the credit dimension, and there's already a lot of um, literature, obviously this one here, you can see is a non-comprehensive list of all the literature that has been done uh, among various assets. So 
you have cost of debt, corporate bonds, uh, distance to default, and options. And um, all of these literature more or less finds that the more exposed you are to the transition, uh, the more financing or protection costs you have. Uh, and in the CDS framework where we are sitting in, um, this also has been done and uh, various channels have been investigated or used rather to sort of um, yeah, investigate this topic. Uh, so you either use carbon emissions and you find that the more you emit, uh, the higher your CDS flat will be, um, or for environment, environmental ratings uh, and so forth. Uh, so also in the CDS framework, we have a lot of literature already that sort of uh, investigates this topic. Um, but other than the last one mentioned here, so the one by Kerbal, uh, they all rely only on past information when it comes to quantifying the carbon risk aspect. So uh, what Kerbal does and in his co-authors, it's a really nice paper, um, which is now published in the Journal of Econometrics, Financial Economet Econometrics, sorry, um, it sort of uses forward-looking information and incorporates this into the analysis. And basically in a similar vein, we are uh, doing something uh, similar. It's a bit different because they use textual data. We will, uh, as you can see, as you will see in, in a minute, we will rely on market data. So what are we doing in this paper? Uh, as I said, the main contribution I would say is that we sort of provide a market-based measure of carbon risk that is high frequency uh, and is forward-looking. Um, so that's, I think, so far this hasn't been done in, and uh, in the literature and it's very, very useful because we want to quantify carbon risk not only with data that relies on past information, but we want to know what is the exposure to carbon risk in the future. That's what interests us. So uh, that's our main contribution, I would say. What we then do is uh, once we have this um, carbon risk factor, which we construct, uh, we um, we then run uh, a battery of, of um, analysis uh, that sort of investigate how carbon risk act on CDS. Uh, before we do that, we sort of provide a small theoretical uh, foundation of what we should expect. And then uh, as you can see here, we have various findings. So we find that the effect is larger for European than North American firms. Uh, we have um, vast sectorial differences. Um, we show that the effect uh, increases when there's more attention towards climate change uh, proxied by, by news coverage. And last, we also, uh, and that is also uh, due to our usage of CDS, we uh, can also look at the term structure of carbon risk and also on the credit risk um, dimension. And that uh, shows in our analysis that, um, or reveals rather that, um, especially in Europe, there seems to be uh, an expectation that carbon regulations will come sooner than later. Um, and this has uh, severe um, cost implications. So as I said, just briefly, let me motivate um, this, uh, the effect of carbon risk on, on, on credit risk. So what we do here, it's, it's a very easy, but still a very nice model, the seminal Merton model. So uh, what we have here, uh, as you can see, is the setup, so the dynamics. And what we introduce into this model, again, it's, it's a very simple idea, but it sort of tries to illustrate our point here. Uh, what we do is we introduce this delta. And this delta is a carbon tax rate. Uh, we assume it to be random, and it sort of impacts the growth of the firm value, right? So uh, the higher the tax rate is, the carbon tax rate, the, the more uh, um, impact it has on the growth of firm value. Um, and we could assume, I think that's a sensible assumption, that polluted firms in general face a higher carbon tax rate than uh, clean firms. Okay, and if we go through the math of the model, uh, we can derive the probability of default. And we can actually see that if the carbon tax rate increases, uh, then this also means the probability of default increases. Hence also um, the CDS spread. And given that we have two different carbon tax rates, 
for polluted and clean firms, um, we can then also preserve the ordering of the probabilities default. Uh, so showing that we should see something in the CDS uh, that is due to carbon risk, right? And um, to build a bit more on the intuition of how the approach will be for our carbon risk factor, uh, I have this, this animated graph here for you. So what you can see here, and it basically relies on uh, what we have already from the theoretical model, but also um, what uh, yeah you see here in the plot. So it's basically that what you what you see is uh, two different firms uh, for either uh, for both the uh, North America and Europe. So let's just focus on on the top panel. That's for North America. You see Conoco Phillips and you see John Deere. And uh, what you also see is so these are the CDS spreads. And what you see is uh, the CDS spread from November 15 until March 2016. And in gray, uh, you see the uh, COP21 resulting in the famous Paris Agreement. And while ConocoPhillips is an oil company, so rather pollutive or very pollutive, you, you could say, uh, you have John Deere, which is a constructor of um, agricultural vehicles. So this one is rather clean. And what you see is that already during uh, COP21, um, but at the latest uh, when the Paris Agreement actually was established, you see that the CDS spreads of those two companies, they diverge, right? So the, the wedge, the difference between those two CDS spreads increases rapidly. And this sort of um, behavior shows us, or I mean, it illustrates, it's I mean, obviously only an example, but it sort of illustrates that we should expect to see carbon risk in the CDS spreads themselves. So we basically leverage on the information that is already contained in the CS spreads. So let me show you another um, GIF that shows precisely the approach we now take. So what we say then is, okay, if the information is already contained in the CDS spreads themselves, we can just build a factor from that. And this sort of goes down to the stuff you do in empirical asset pricing. So for all of you, uh, I mean, probably small minus big and H uh, and high minus low are, are common, um, common names, right? Common factors. So, and the idea here is similar. Uh, what we do is we look at uh, the top polluters and we look at the bottom polluters. And within each group, we then take the median, uh, median CDS spread. So what we then have on the top panel is the, a median polluter firm and in green, a median clean firm. And again, you see there's a difference and this difference increases after the Paris Agreement and becomes even larger afterwards. And this difference precisely will be our um, carbon risk factor. So here you can see, um, yeah, the, the formal description. As I said, we use the top 20 and bottom 20 emitters at each point in time T to compute the median cost of default protection for polluted and clean firms. And then look at the um, difference, which then will serve as our carbon risk factor. And besides the easy um, construction, it also has a very neat interpretation because what it basically does is it mimics the dynamics of a port portfolio in which you buy default protection for a polluted firm, a uh, representative polluted firm, and where you uh, sell this protection for a clean firm. Uh, again, a representative clean firm. So this has a very neat um, interpretation uh, besides uh, the easy construction. So here you can see the, the CR for the different regions. Uh, on the left side, you see it for Europe and uh, on, on the right side for North America. And this um, or these plots bear two interesting insights. So the first one being that if you compare those two regions, you see that the CR, the way we construct it, always delivered the positive premium for Europe, meaning that the cost that you have to pay in order to protect yourself against the default of a polluted firm 
is always higher than uh, the cost that you need to pay for a green fur. Whereas in North America, that's not true. In fact, if you look at the entire range, you see that in the end, uh, you would have uh, a negative premium for all 10 years uh, under consideration. So here we just look at one, five and 30 years. Um, we also look at uh, three and 10 years, uh, but again, um, they, they look the same. So there's no difference. And the other interesting aspect is that it sort of reacts to policy relevant events. So in green, and that's what you already saw in the GIF, is that it increases after Paris. So Paris is basically this uh, vertical green line. And you see that it um, reacted to that. Uh, also, what you see in North America, um, depicted by the vertical brown line, uh, which is the Trump election, that after the Trump election, you see a decrease um, in, uh, in the CR. Right. Whereas for Europe, that's not really happening a lot, but that's to be expected due to the uh, un uh, irrelevance of um, of the Trump election for for Europe. Right. So that's these two insights are important to take away from this plot. Another thing we can do, which again is due to the fact that we have multiple tenures available, we can also have a look at the term structure of carbon risk here. So. Uh, here in blue and orange, you see a short term, um, the short term slope, sort of, sort of, which is five minus one year, and the long term, which is 30 minus five year. And um, you see that, especially for the short term, there is a reaction um, after the Paris Agreement in terms of a uh, shift in the uh, carbon risk term structure. Uh, that uh, increases, and for the long term, there's not really a lot happening. Something for North America, but uh, for Europe, there's not really something happening. Again, this sort of uh, this plot here is more in, in serves more as an illustration to sort of motivate uh, one of the analysis we will do later on. That is uh, looking at the term structure. Okay, um, talking about. Uh, analysis and, and results. Uh, this is the data we uh, use. So we use uh, single names CDS spreads for uh, five different tenures, ranging from one to 30 years. And um, we do this for two regions, Europe and North America, um, where we have a, a good coverage of firms. In particular for CDS, it's not common to have as many observations or firms rather than uh, in the equity world, for example. So that's a good coverage, especially as we look on daily data. Uh, so we have to make sure that uh, the data is liquid enough. Um, and we look at it from 2013 to 2019. Um, then from an econo econometrical per perspective, we have to take care of non-stationarity issues. So that's why we look at um, the daily CDS spread log return rather than uh, the CDS levels directly. And the same applies to the CDS slope. There we look at the change in the CDS slope. So the CDS slope will be the measure of interest in the term structure model, right? And um, again, we have, um, yeah, we have uh, non stationarity issues here. So um, that was our dependent variable, um, or the two dependent variables, I should say. Uh, for the control variables, we rely on the uh, on two firm specific measures, namely stock return and volatility, um, and a market specific measure that captures the general uh, economic climate. And um, although we only have three control variables, this model has to be proven or has been proven to be very powerful uh, and yet parsimonious. So um, that is really good because in case we use daily data as we um, it's not easy to use as many uh, variables as possible uh, or the other control variables that have been, have been established in the literature just because, um, yeah, we really need a, a good frequency of data here. And those three are obviously uh, available on a daily data and, uh, again, uh, have been shown to ver be very influential and um, thus we simply use those three. Um, in terms of our methodological, methodological approach, we um, use a quantile regression model. So we not, just not uh, 
want to miss information. That's the main reason. So usually what you would do is a simple panel contrary, uh, panel regression model um, and focus on the conditional mean. However, we want to provide more information. So we don't only want to provide the effect of carbon risk on the center of the distribution, but also um, at the tails of the distribution, right? That is particularly useful for risk management purposes. So as we are talking about risk, um, it's important to understand how the tail behavior is and not only the effect in the center. Um, so let's move on to the uh, base model, um, which we want to, which sort of uh, starts with the, with the empirical investigation. Mm, and our first hypothesis is, and that's basically motivated by, um, by the model, by the theoretical model we had in the beginning, that there should be a positive relationship between our carbon risk factor, which we augment into the base model and CDS spread returns. The logic being here, the more exposure you have to carbon risk, the more the valuation of the firm will go down, the higher the probability of default, and also ultimately the higher the CDS threat will be, right? And this higher exposure will be represented by an increase in the delta, right? And uh, so based on that, we would posit the following hypothesis. So here you can see the results um, for Europe, actually, um, for the 10 years, one, five, and 30 years. And the high, um, area highlighted in gray sort of shows the effect of our carbon risk factor. And what we see is that there's a strong positive effect, especially if you compare the effect to uh, other influential drivers like stock return or volatility. Uh, so there is a very strong effect. And that's another important observation. We see the effect is much more pronounced in the tails. So especially if a firm is doing bad, already bad, then carbon risk chimes sort of in and sort of amplifies the effect, right? So we have an amplifying effect here at the tails, meaning that if a firm is already doing bad on the credit dimension though, uh, then the CR will, will further amplify this effect. All right, and um, so based on this, we sort of established a positive um, relationship as we expected. Um, another sensible hypothesis is that we that we should expect a higher effect um, or stronger effect in Europe than in North America. Why that? Simply because the regulatory framework in Europe is much, much uh, more stringent um, than in North America. And so, Given the, the Merton model, we could sort of assume that the delta, the carbon tax rate in Europe is higher than in North America. And that would result in the fact that um, uh, the effect should be much stronger in, in Europe. So here you can see the results for one tenure. It's the same for all the other tenures. There's just one uh, as an example here for Europe and North America. And you see the effect is much, much stronger uh, for Europe than it is for North America. Uh, I mean, it's like factor 100 or even more than that. So, and also, especially if you compare it to, uh, to the other influential uh, control variables, uh, the effect in North America isn't that strong. Um, another thing we can do, because I mean, now we just looked at, um, at the general uh, economic, uh, economy, uh, economy, sorry. And uh, what we also can do, obviously, is to look at the sectoral effects. Uh, and in order to do that, we sort of um, extend the model and include sector dummies to see and interact them with our car risk factor to see whether the effect is stronger in certain um, sectors. And you can see uh, here that uh, the effect is especially strong in those three highlighted um, sectors, so base materials energy and utilities, where the effect is uh, really strong uh, in Europe um, and all the others more or less. All, they also have a positive effect, but it's it's less pronounced. In North America, you have a similar picture. So basic materials, again, and energy have the strongest effects. Um, the only really 
sector that is missing here is utilities, but other than that, it's still um, uh, more or less the same industries that are that are affected. Okay, um, then to the attention aspect. So uh, climate policies usually evolve in a very dynamic setup uh, or in a dynamic world. And you have uh, a lot of changes, uh, daily changes in, in policy and, and um, demand and so forth. So you have a lot of things that are going on and uh, this new information arrives um, continually but it's uh, only gradually evolving over time and showing the extent to what it actually uh, matters. And what we sort of want to investigate with this, uh, with this uh, hypothesis here is that when there is more attention towards climate change covered, for example, by news, then we should expect a, a higher effect of, um, of our CR. Yeah, because then, the, the coverage is simply higher and people are more aware of, of, of climate change. And so carbon risk acts more uh, salient than it should or uh, than, it, than it would if um, there's less attention. And in order to do that, we augment our model with, um, with a dummy that sort of captures high attention towards climate change. Uh, we use two different news indices for that. So we use the one uh, by BUA and co-authors for Europe and the MCCC index by ADIA and co-authors for North America. They both provide um, uh, information on coverage and, and sentiment uh, at a daily level, which is nice for our analysis and allows us to look at uh, what the effect is. Hey, Alex, yeah. just letting you know you've got about one and a half minutes left. Okay, perfect. Uh, so. Uh, I will just uh, very quickly describe this one here. So what you can see is that there is some effect that is increasing um, for uh, for more if there's more attention, but it's uh, only really for the short-term maturity. So you see here one and three years, but for the longer, you don't really see anything. And then last, um, yeah, as I already indicated in the beginning, we have different tenures allowing us to look at the uh, slope um, of the of the CBS curve, and uh, we again pose it, posit that if uh, there is uh, that there is a positive relationship between term structure of calm risk and CBS spread slopes. Why is that? Uh, because, for example, if you uh, assume that or see that there's a new carbon regulation coming that has a more pressing deadline coming with it, then you should also expect these costs to be seen in the CBS curve. So you see, you should see an, uh, an according uh, adjustment in, in the CBS curve. And below at the bottom, you can see the model. So we have some, some term structure uh, variables here that are different from the control variables we introduced earlier. So basically what you have here is the interest rate, uh, the slope for the economic um, state of, uh, yeah, of the, of the economic state and, and that's it. And here you can see the result just of the CR slope for both regions. And in Europe, you see that, especially for the short term, there's a very pronounced effect. For the long term, there's also a pronounced effect, but it's particularly interesting to see that, especially in the short term, there seems to be a high uh, or a strong effect. For North America, we don't really see anything except maybe at the tails, but that's about it. So to wrap up, I mean, uh, I already, said everything that is written down here. So I will stop here and uh, thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to the discussion and uh, I'm also happy to answer any questions in case there are any. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alexander. Um, so now we've got Quinn 